precious in your sight. Lord, we ask that you would minister to us this morning, that we might hear your voice, that we might uh, be fully aware of, of, of your presence here. As we look to you, Lord, bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Today we're looking at Isaac and what his example can teach us concerning uh, living by faith. The great men in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, they are called, often called the patriarchs. They're called the patriarchs because they are the founding fathers, if you will, of the Jewish nation. But of all the patriarchs, we know them all by, by name, they're all very familiar to us, yet of all of them, Isaac is the one who actually lived the longest. Yet less is written about him than any of the others. Someone once said of Isaac, he was the ordinary son of a great father and the ordinary father of a great son. Apart from the story of the sacrifice on Mount Moriah, which we looked at last week when he was still a young man living at home with his parents, there really is no great achievement that we link to his name. No great test of faith that jumps to mind, that we associate with Isaac. So why then is his name included in Hebrews chapter 11, amongst the great heroes of the faith? <clears throat> well, perhaps the first lesson we should learn from this today is that God sees things in a way that we don't. God places a value on people that we might otherwise overlook. We should not be so quick to dismiss what we sometimes call the ordinary, the ordinary life, ordinary people. Most lives, really, by definition, are ordinary. Much of our lifetime is spent doing ordinary things. Sleeping, getting up in the morning, uh, eating, you know, uh, <coughs> taking house going to work, taking some time to meet up with a couple of friends, and these kinds of things. Someone once took time to calculate just how much we spend in our typical lives, a typical life of 70 years. 23 years of that is spent sleeping, almost a third of your life. A total of 16 years is spent working. Another eight years is spent watching TV. Six years eating, Six years traveling, four and a half years on leisure, four years being ill, two years getting dressed, and half a year going to church. <coughs> Mark Twain, one of the great, uh, one of America's great writers, is known for his right sense of humor, but he was also a very keen observer of humankind, the human condition. He once wrote, there was never yet an uninteresting life. Such a thing is an impossibility. Inside of the dullest exterior there is a drama, a comedy, a tragedy. I hate even to use the word ordinary in reference to another person. In reality, as Twain says, there is no such thing as an ordinary life. We've just come through another Christmas. One of the things that uh, we associate with the modern holiday season are Christmas films. There are whole TV channels now devoted to playing nothing but Christmas movies 24-7. And they start playing them in September. I know I'm going to sound a bit like a Grinch here, but I really can't bear most Christmas movies. I'd much rather find a quiet corner, pour myself something hot to drink, and read a book. Anyways. For all the nonsense put to film and called a Christmas special, there are a few that have become classics in their own right. And one of them is Frank Capra's film, It's a Wonderful Life, starring James Stewart. The whole point of the film is to show just how important one life can be. On the surface, George Bailey led an unremarkable life. It was his brother remember, who went off and fought in the wars and became a national hero while he stayed behind at home. Yet by the end of the film, we're shown just how important one life is and what a difference one life can make to the lives of so many others. 
No life is unimportant. Every life has value, and every life has value to God. So much of our lives are made up of the seemingly insignificant routine of daily living. And yet this is often where our lives break down. In the Old Testament, in the little book, the Song of Solomon, there's a verse there that warns us about the little foxes. It speaks of the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's not so much the big foxes that you have to worry about. They're a problem, yes. I mean, they can jump up and they can eat the fruit on the upper branches. But the vine remains and it will produce fruit another year. But apparently it's the little foxes that can cause more damage. They're not big enough yet to reach the fruit. And so they gnaw away at the base of the vine, at the roots. Eventually the damage they do will kill off the vine altogether. <coughs> Beware the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's just like that in life. It's often not the big crises that do the most damage. But the little things. The little things, the little niggles, the little annoyances that slowly eat away at us and destroy relationships and can ruin lives. Elijah was a great prophet of God. We all remember that amazing showdown we had on Mount Carmel, where there he was in front of the eyes of all the great and powerful of the nation. But his real ministry, the real work of what he did, wasn't there on the mountaintop, not that brief moment of glory there at Mount Carmel, not his so-called 15 seconds of fame. No, the real significance of his life was his faithful ministry that followed on afterwards for the next 10 years. Day in and day out, ministering to the 7,000 people that we know were in the land who had refused to bow the knee to a false god. David was Israel's greatest king. He won many victories on the battlefield. He brought peace to the land. He composed some of the world's greatest poetry. They have it in the book of Psalms. A source of spiritual comfort and encouragement to unnumbered millions down through the ages. Yet it was one lingering glance from the rooftop of his palace that led to the greatest sin he ever committed and almost destroyed the kingdom. So you see, there's little about life that we can call truly unimportant or inconsequential. It's we who often speak of people or things as commonplace or ordinary, but you won't find that language anywhere in the Bible. Every life, as I said earlier, has value to God. Every life is full of a potential to bring Him honour and glory. Every life can be used as a source of blessing to others. So what can we learn then from the life of Isaac, this so-called ordinary man, that will help us to live better a life of faith? Why is he even mentioned in this chapter at all? To answer that, we need to go back to the book of Genesis now and take a closer look at his life. So let's turn, if we will, to the passage Johnny read a few moments ago. Genesis chapter 25. Look at the opening verses there. Verses, well, it's not the opening verse of the chapter, but where uh, the reading began. Verse 19 and 20. These are the generations of Isaac, Abram's son. Abram begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of the the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Anyone who has ever had children or who has worked with children will know just how different they can be one from another. They can be identical twins. They can look exactly alike. They can even move sometimes in the same way. And yet when it comes to their personality, they're as different as chalk and cheese. Some kids are just born active. The moment they take their first breath, they start demanding your attention. They're active children. They never seem to sit still. They seem destined to live life to the fullest. They, they take life by the horns and they're determined to bend it to their will. They're natural born leaders. And no matter what they do, they seem to make an impact. They're just good at everything. And then there are other children. Quiet. Docile. They don't demand attention. In fact, they even shun it. 
They, they're uncomfortable with being out in the forefront. They much rather be in the background and let somebody else take the lead. And it seems that Isaac was just such a person, a passive individual. We see him as a child, quietly putting up with all the taunts and the insults of his older stepbrother Ishmael. We saw him last week meekly submitting to his father's extreme request and allowing himself to be bound and laid upon an altar of sacrifice. As a young man, he remained single until he was 40 years old. It was his father who finally sought out a woman for him to marry. As an adult, we see him graciously bearing the rebuke of others. As a farmer, in any contest over finding wells for his sheep, he willingly yielded to others, putting off confrontation for as long as he could. Yet Isaac is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great examples of faith. Why? We see, in his own quiet way, he demonstrated an extraordinary faith in God. We already saw some of that faith last week when he was to have been sacrificed on an altar. I mean, that was an extreme test of faith and obedience. And yet we see him trusting his father Abraham and trusting in the goodness of God. In that extraordinary trial, Isaac learned some valuable lessons. He learned to trust God no matter what, even when sometimes God's commands seem to run counter to his thinking, to our understanding, to reason and common sense. He also learned that God will provide, even in the most impossible circumstances. These lessons were not wasted on him. He took to heart what God had done. He didn't just slide along life on the coattails of his father and his father's faith. Isaac, Isaac learned to trust God for himself. He'd seen God do the impossible. So when his own wife, Rebecca, couldn't have children, he prayed. He prayed to the Lord on her behalf. Look at verse 21. Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebecca, his wife, Conceived. God had blessed his stepbrother Ishmael, that one that kind of bullied him as a child, with many sons. Look back at verse 12 for just a moment. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abram's other son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bore unto Israel. <coughs> And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. And they went through a whole list of 12 different... You get down to the bottom of verse 6 and we see they, these are the names by their towns and by their castles. 12 princes according to their nations. So they weren't just 12 sons, but they were 12 sons that went out and were significant leaders in their own right. And yet here's Isaac and Rebekah. And they have none. <coughs> What's more, Isaac knew, knew God's promise knew what God had promised to Abraham, that Abraham would become the father of many nations. And he knew that he, Isaac, he was the son of the promise. That through him, God would fulfill his promise to Abraham. And yet here they were. He and his wife were childless. In his difficulty and trial, Isaac did the very best possible thing he could. He took his problems to the Lord in prayer. What's your instinctive response when you're faced with a problem? Do you roll up your sleeves? Determined to let, you know, not to let life get you down? Ready to, to take charge, to do what you can, to, to sort things out, to do what you think is the best? Maybe give others a piece of your mind while you're at it? Or do you roll over and complain about your misfortune? Pull down the blinds and shut out the light. You turn off your phones and refuse to take phone calls. You hide away and throw a little pity party for yourself. And you wonder why it must always be me. Why nobody else? Why never uh, anything ever seems to turn right for, for, for you? Or do you take your problems to the Lord? Do you seek to know the wisdom of the all-seeing one? Do you take your problems to the one with the power to make a difference? Do you take your cares and worries to the one who loves you 
with an everlasting love. As the Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Well, Isaac prayed. He had to wait 20 years. I suspect he kept praying all the way through those 20 years before he finally got an answer. How long does it take for you to help before you give up on praying for something? Well, Isaac kept praying. Verse 24, we find that when her days were to be delivered, they were fulfilled. Behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over, like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Esau means red. Out of his name, red. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. His name is called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. 20 years later, he finally got the answer. It's been said that God's delays are not necessarily denials. Sometimes the reason God doesn't answer your prayer right off is because it's just not the right time yet. It's just that God knows best. And God will act when the time is right. Not a moment too soon and not a moment too late. You see, God had more to accomplish in Isaac's life than just giving him a child. Than just fulfilling his promise. God was also seeking at the same to build up Isaac, as he does with each one of us. Seeking to strengthen and deepen his faith. We go through life a bit like a horse wearing blinders. All we can see is what's right in front of us. We can only see a part of the picture at any given time. We can never see the whole picture. But God does. And that's where it comes where we need to learn to trust in Him and His wisdom and guidance. God knows more than we do because He can see what we can't see. God sees what's coming. God knows what is best. And we can rest in the knowledge that God will only ever do what is good and right and best. Now, a few moments ago, we read the passage in Hebrews chapter 11. It said that uh, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things yet to come. It's so all it said about him in Hebrews 11. The day came when God blessed Isaac and Rebekah with a child. In fact, two children. She gave birth not just to one son, but to two. Jacob and Esau. God filled his promise yet again. Here's another lesson that we can learn from Isaac. He not only believed in God's promise for himself, when the time came, he passed on the promises of God to his sons, when they were old enough to understand. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things yet to come. He taught them concerning the promises of God, and even though those promises seemed impossible, even though they seemed afar off, even though Isaac would never live to see them properly fulfilled, yet he believed God. He believed God's word. And he imparted this faith to his children. He took the time, he took the effort to bring his children to God. When Isaac blessed his sons, he was showing them that he had faith in the word of God. So we see thus far that Isaac demonstrated then a personal faith in the Lord. He provided his family with an example to follow. But, as we shall see, uh, his example was a mixed one. There were positive traits to be seen from his example, and there were also some negative ones. Isaac, in other words, at least in this respect, was not too different from any one of the rest of us. He had his good qualities, and his not so good. He was, in a manner of speaking, an ordinary person. First, let me say a few things about the positive example that he provided. As we've noted already, he instilled God's promises within his children. Griffith Thomas says in his excellent commentary in Genesis, Faith never confines itself just to the person of the believer himself, but takes in his home and his children. When God gets a hold of your heart, you don't want God just for yourself. You want those you love to share in the blessing as well. As parents, whether we intend it or not, 
we provide our children with an example. <coughs> Sometimes it's less about what we have to say to them than how we live our lives before them, day in and day out. They learn by watching us, by the choices we make. They learn from our inconsistencies. They seem to learn those a whole lot better than the lessons you try to sell them. They learn by seeing how we deal with difficulties and obstacles. And that's how they learn to deal with difficulties and obstacles in their lives. I can't get my head around those parents who call themselves Christians, but don't demonstrate any real concern to see their children brought up in the nurture and damage of the Lord. Perhaps they're just too busy with themselves and their own wants and wishes, too concerned about their own problems and mistakes, and they kind of forget that their children have needs too. They either fail or they don't see the need to make the time, to take the effort, to bring up the children to know the Lord. I scratched my head and I said, what are they thinking? Do such parents really believe that kids will just spontaneously turn out alright in the end just because? Well, our kids are going to turn out alright because, well, we're good parents. Our kids will turn out alright because, well, there are kids. Look at us, we turned out alright. They'll be okay. If only it were that easy. If only it were just that simple. So why then do children sometimes grow up to disappoint their parents? You see, bringing up a child and training it in the way that they should go is not easy. It isn't just that simple. There are no shortcuts. And just when you as a parent think you've got it all sussed, you realise you haven't got a clue. <laughs> Back in Genesis 18, we see the kind of parent that God is looking for. Here God is speaking to Abram. You're there now in Genesis. I'll just turn back to chapter 18. <coughs> I think it's verse 19. Yes. Here we see what God has to say about the kind of father he's looking for. Verse Genesis 18 and verse 19, he says to Abraham, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment and righteousness, that the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he has spoken of him. You see, Abram set the tone in his household. He took the lead. He didn't just say the right things, but he lived it out before his family, day in and day out. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Many parents can say the right things, but it's living it out in the home before them. Before those little eyes, that's what really matters. That's where the real challenge lies. It's about being prepared to do and say the right things even when you don't feel like it. Even when you're tired, or frustrated, or, or angry. Remember what we said earlier about the little foxes spoiling the vine? It's the little things. It's the little inconsistency that arrives that often cause more harm and ruin than the big one-offs. This is why as parents it's so important that we are committed to the Lord. To pray, to teach, to train our children, to live a consistent, daily, godly example before them, day, week in and week out. But put the time in now, and it will reap abundant reward later. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. By the way, what I've been saying about parenthood, the same applies to us in, uh, when it comes to uh, our, our witness before others, our testimony in, in the wider community. It's the little things that you say and do. It's the little inconsistencies. These are the things that people remember about you. So it's important as Christians that we take the time and the effort to make sure that we live in such a way as to bring honour and glory to the Lord in all that we say to Well, anyway, as I noted before, Isaac wasn't perfect. He and his wife Rebecca had their personal shortcomings. And one of the shortcomings they had was that they played favourites with their children. Look at verse 27. Back, this is back now in Isaiah 25. Excuse me, Genesis 25 and verse 27. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man. 
dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he didn't eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac, this man of reserved character, the passive one, he took great pride in his son Esau, the big strong one, the hunter, the man of action. Whereas Rebecca, well, she liked Jacob, the homebody, the one who stayed behind in the tents and helped her out with all the chores. Now God had already made clear what his will was with regard to the two sons. The younger son was to receive the promise. In fact, in verse 23, the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from you. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. God made his will clear. The promise of Abraham was to pass through the younger son, through Jacob, the younger of the twins. So what should have been the response of the parents? They should have submitted themselves willingly and obediently to God's will. But what do we see in fact? What, they, what actually happened? And instead of accepting God's will, they played favorites. They schemed and intrigued behind each other's backs to see that their own favorite got the greater part of the blessing. And this foolishness brought strife and division. It brought hatred and conflict into the home. They virtually guaranteed that their sons would grow up competing against each other. At his mother's bidding, Jacob deceived his own father and appeared to rob Esau out of what he thought was rightfully his. Esau was so angry, he wanted to kill his brother. Jacob had to flee from home, from his family. He spent years living far away in exile. What a disaster! And none of it had to happen. But as you see, if you read on, even despite all the willfulness and the trickery of, 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 we see in his family, God still was at work, working out his will. The day came, thankfully, years on, when Jacob and Esau, much older, a little wiser as adults, and families of their own, they met up, and they made their peace with each other. In a sense, it kind of turned out all right in the end. But how much grief, how much misery, how much loneliness, how much separation could have been spared? How many happy memories and good times were lost because Isaac and Rebecca and their shortcomings as parents? I don't have time this morning to tell the story, but this wasn't the only time that Isaac failed to trust in the Lord fully. The day came when the land suffered famine. Things got really hard. There was a downturn in the fortunes. So what do you do? We'll look at uh, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 1. There was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, and to Gerar. He did exactly what his father Abraham did when he was faced with a famine. He moved. There was a famine in the land. You remember, and Abraham picked up sticks and went all the way down to Egypt. And what happened to him when he got to Egypt? Nothing but trouble. One problem after another. Well, here's Isaac facing a famine. And what does he do? Well, instead of staying put where God had told him to stay, he picks up sticks as well and leaves behind the land of promise. Only this time he doesn't go to Egypt. But he goes to Gerar, the land of the Philistines, a little closer. His move was not outright obedient, disobedience, but neither was he acting in faith. He obeyed God's voice in so much that he didn't go all the way down into Egypt, but neither did he go back to the land of promise. He stayed right where he was in the land of Gerar. Instead of trusting God to take care of him in the place where God had told him to be, Isaac thinks he knows better, so he moves away to a place that he thinks he'll be better off. Sometimes it is God's will for us to move. But other times God wants us to stay right where we are, where He's placed us. How can you know the difference? Well, seek the Lord's face. Seek His will. He'll make it clear to you. So what happened to Isaac? 
How did he get on in this land, the strange land of Gerar? Well, while he was there in the land, while he was there outside of the will of God, he got into deeper trouble. That's what happens. He told lies. It was a selfish and cowardly behavior, but he'd seen his father do exactly the same thing. He lost his testimony, and he was rebuked. It's a sad day when the child of God is rebuked by an unbeliever. He suffered conflict. Everywhere he went, there was conflict over the wells between the people that already lived there and, and himself and his own flocks. I don't have time to go into the whole story, but let me just say for now, he was afraid of the people around him. So he told a lie to protect himself and put his own family at risk. He experienced nothing but conflict the whole time he was there in Gerar, the whole time he was outside the will of God. He and the residents of the land were continually fighting over access to the water rights. And every time Isaac's servants would take a new well, the Philistines would come along and take it from him. There was little that Isaac could do. And in the process, he lost his testimony. He lost his happiness. He lost his peace. He lost his power with God. But despite Isaac's failures and mistakes, God does not reject him. God doesn't toss him away on the heap and forget about him. Isaac may have stumbled in his faith, he may have fallen, but God doesn't give up on Isaac. By the way, God doesn't give up on us either when we stumble and fall. Every time Isaac faced a new conflict with the people in that foreign land, Isaac just picked up quietly and moved to another location. And unwittingly, each time he moved his tent, he was actually moving it a little closer back to the place where he came come from, where God wanted him to be. Whether Isaac realized it or not, God was using each of these little conflicts in his life to get all these little unpleasant circumstances to <coughs> get Isaac to move a little closer to the place where he should have been all along. Only when Isaac returned all the way to the land, only then did God speak to him once more. You know Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, look at verse 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bless you and I will multiply your seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And Isaac built there an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. And pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. It was only when Isaac had returned to Beersheba, only then did God speak to him. And we find at the same time, not only that, but as you read on, his enemies made peace with him. It was only when he returned to Beersheba that they found, finally, a continual source of water to, for his family and for his flocks. It was on the very day that they returned to the land of promise. Look down at verse 32. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told them concerning the well which they dig, dug, and said unto them, We have found water, and he called it Sheba, which means uh, the well, and therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. The moment Isaac returned to the place of God's will, wherever that might be, he experienced God's blessing. It's a mistake for us to think that we can have it our own way and still expect to experience God's blessing. It was only when Isaac submitted himself fully to God's will that he found peace and power with God once more. He had to forsake his own will, his own thinking, his own wit and ingenuity. He had to learn to trust completely in the Lord. But when he did, Isaac was a man a lot like many of us in so many ways. He wasn't a major mover and shaker. Outside of his own family and acquaintances, he really wasn't widely known. But he had God in his life. That made all the difference. Whenever he leaned to his own understanding, Isaac became a victim. But when he trusted in God, he became a man of power and influence. 
you want your life to count? Do you want your life to count for God? Parents, do you want to see your children grow up to love uh, uh, the Lord and, and honour Him in their lives? How serious are you about these things? How earnestly do you covet God's blessing? Then learn to live each moment for the Lord. Learn to put your own comfort to ease, your own wants and wishes second place. And give the Lord top priority in your life. If we would see those we love brought to Christ, if we would see our lives, in a sense, come for God, then we must learn to trust and obey Him in all things. To submit to Him, His will, to His word, and to follow Him in all His ways. There is no other way but Jesus. Just a few thoughts from the example of Isaac's life. Trust God can use that to speak to your heart this morning. Any questions or concerns about what is said, I invite you to come. I'm delighted to speak with you and to pray with you further. Let's close with a song. Willie Black Covenant.